Wasometrics and welcome to Wasometrics Life Sciences Exam Guide. My name is Looney and I will be assisting you to get all your questions through to us. All you need to do is follow Wasometrics social media pages and download the To Enable app for free on your app store to take part on today's assessment. There are so many prizes to be won, so do stay tuned. I'm not alone today. With me are Yugen and our sign language interpreter, Nicolene. Good day to you guys and over to you. Thanks, Looney. Welcome, Grade 12s. And this is an installment of Life Sciences Paper 1 Exam Guide. You guys are busy, obviously, preparing for your final exams. It's a very significant point in, in your exam preparation. How do you approach this exam? And that's crucial to really performing well. So this this session is going to look at how we look at paper one, its structure, we're going to look at the content of that paper, and we're going to look at some common mistakes and how do we address that. So let's get straight into this. When we look at life science paper one, we know that this is a two and a half hour exam. It is 150 marks, and we know that there are three sections. Let's take some time to look at what happens in this two and a half hour exam? If you were to break that up, you would know that that's 150 minutes that we need to complete 150 marks. I mean, you guys are bright and you know that that's a ratio of a mark per minute. And so it means that you've got to think about exactly how long a question that is 40 marks should take you. And if you do the maths, that's very simple, it should take you 40 minutes. And I think often learners struggle with managing the time. And in an exam, I would urge you to look at the question and to look at the time allocation for that or the mark allocation. So if you see a question that has a 20 mark allocation, you've got to spend 20 minutes on that, more or less. And I think it will give you a good guide to whether you're on track and going to complete that exam on time. When we look at the structure of this exam, we know that in the past you've written prelim exam papers. There are three sections to this. And so we're going to look at each of these sections and try and analyze the types of questions and how you would approach this exam paper. Section A consists of 50 marks. This has a series of shorter questions, and each of these questions can vary between 5 to 10 marks and consist of your multiple choice questions, questions based on terminology, some matching the columns, probably true and false, as well as labeling diagrams. And all of this should be done in nothing more than 50 minutes. And this is a good guide to guiding you to establishing what we call a completed paper on time. And if I may pause at this point and reflect on the structure of this. Remember that the examiner sets the exam with question section A being a section which I call the lower hanging fruits. Now this means these are the easier marks for you to, to, to get. And so your, your aim of this paper is try and maximize these lower hanging fruits and to pull them and to grab onto these marks. So often learners tend to do that but tend to spend longer than the 50 minutes allocated to this section. So remember that this is an easier section and you should be maximizing the marks in this. Okay, so that's a heads up for section A. Let's move on to what section B looks like. Section B consists of 80 marks and hence it should take you approximately, as I said, 80 minutes to finish this. It seems mighty long, but it's broken up into two long questions. Questions 2 and 3 are 40 marks each. And this means that you've got to pace yourself to answering these questions within 40 minutes each. And what is very important to note also is that you do not necessarily have to start with question 2 first. You could choose to start with question 3 and then get back to question 2. And the reason I say this is that we all have a different comfort level of sections that we're familiar with. So there might be a question that you really think is going to go well and that you've prepared well on, attempt that first. Complete that question and then move on to the next question. It is important for you to remember that each of these questions have a number that is specific to them. 
And hence you must number the questions exactly to the way the questions are numbered. And that's important. Right. So in this, you've got longer questions. And these questions are broken up into subsections where you have different themes and different topics in that. And so pay special attention to this section because these are your questions that are the middle order which are a bit more challenging that require you to read and interpret and analyze the question very carefully. Okay. We then move on to section C, which is the favorite part of the exam. And I know that you all dread this section because it's the essay. And, and unfortunately, that is a misconception. misconception. What you've got to do is you've got to look at this section and use this as a vantage point to scoring maximum marks. And we'll talk about how to approach that as we get into looking at essay sections and how to improve that. So this is obviously a section that has 20 marks. And I'm always encouraging the learners to try and finish sections A and B much quicker and so that you can have a bit more than 20 minutes to finish this. And often that's the guide to trying to finish section A and B in a quicker time and having a bit more time than 20 minutes to finish this. It's important for us when we prepare for this exam to know exactly what the content is for paper one. And I think you could start off with looking at your notes. And when we look at paper one, these are the topics that you see. Meiosis, which is common to both paper one and paper two, is a common thread to both these exams. Reproduction in vertebrates, and you can refer to those sections where we talk about ovipary, vivipary, ovovivipary, we can also bring in altricial and precocial development. We talk about the K strategy and the R strategy. We also have human reproduction, which is a, a major component of this paper. We also refer to, in this paper, the response of individuals to the environment, specifically humans, as well as plants. There's an important component of this, which is endocrine system, which closely links to the reproductive system. And I think that's something that you must always look at studying together. We also have homeostasis in humans, again, a common link to human reproduction and the endocrine system. So we need to study these three sections together. Finally, we have human impact on the environment. And if you guys recollect, this was a section that you spent time doing in grade 11. And it's crucial that you go back to grade 11 notes and you reflect on those. Because often we have this section that's left out in your grade 12 year, but it is an integral part of your grade 12 paper one. So refer to the impact of humans on the environment and bring that into your revision program. Let's look at the percentage and the weighting of these marks per section. We know that meiosis is in both paper one and paper two, and you'll clearly see that in this paper, it makes up 7% of the exam which is approximately 11 marks. Reproduction in vertebrates is 4% of this exam and it contributes to 6 marks of this exam. And what's good about learning these smaller sections is that if you learn them well, you have a guaranteed 17 marks that you can easily bank. Human reproduction is a significant portion of this exam. If you look at it, it makes up 21% of the exam which is approximately 31 marks. And hence, a lot of emphasis needs to be placed on this topic. The next section in, in this paper is the response of humans to the environment. And this talks about the, the nervous system, the structure of the eye and the ear. And again, a significant portion of this, probably the lar largest portion of paper one. A huge 40 marks. And hence, the examiner is going to spend a lot of time developing questions to address this specific topic. So learn well. The human endocrine system makes up 10% of this exam, which is approximately 15 marks. And then we have the response of plants to the environment, and that's an approximate 7 marks, or 7%, with 11 marks contributing to that. I did skip homeostasis. That's also 11 marks. And finally, we have the section which is on human impact from grade 11s that is brought into your grade 12 here, 
and that's 25 marks. So guys, if we look at this section of the exam, you can strategize and look at exactly how you can plan ahead for this exam. What's important is that you look at these sections and you structure your learning program so that you spend the emphasis on these topics so that you can get the marks that are allocated to that. Guys, we're going to go into a little short break. And when we get back, we're going to look at more tips on how to deal with this paper. Over to you, Looney. Thanks, Yuvan. I'm sure that breakdown will help our learners quite a lot. Don't go anywhere, guys. We'll be back right after the break. Welcome back guys, if you've just joined us, we are going through your exam guide in preparation for your upcoming exam. While some exciting news, Waza Matrix is having a hashtag Waza Winner competition where one of you stand a chance to win 2 gigs of data. To enter, see the details below. Before I go over to you again, please don't forget to take part in the assessment that's available on the To Enable app and we'll check your results later. Thank you again. Over to you. Thanks, Looney. Welcome back, guys. And as Looney said, there's some good prizes up for grabs. We always need data. And you know that competitions like these, you have a good chance to win if you take part in them. So let's get back to the exam strategy for paper one. So it's important for us to identify what is the best way to look at preparing or getting ready for an exam. It's important that you revise each section using summary notes. And I know that during your prelim exams, you would have prepared notes. So you don't have to go back and remake notes. You've got these notes, refer back to your notes. If you do not have notes, it's a good time to very quickly start summarizing those key points and preparing some revision notes that you can easily refer to. Guys, it's important that you highlight or underline. It's fundamental to the way we learn. And the, the important concept of highlighting is that color enhances learning. And you would know that from your lessons in class that your teachers have often used images with color. They've often used highlighters. They've colored in images on the board. And that's to help you recognize or remember important concepts. So color plays an important part of learning. So highlight, annotate as well. And I'll refer to annotate in a bit. Create a list of terminology, and I often refer to this as a vocab list. And this is crucial to section A. And as I mentioned, those lower hanging fruits that are easier to get come from terminology, matching. And hence, if you create a list of terms per section, and it's easy to do that, as you go through your notes on a blank sheet of paper, list these terms. Having them listed makes it easier for you to Separate them and identify them. Put yourself in that space the night before the exam. You've got all these lists of terms that you quickly can go through. And that's going to be key to spending a few hours before that exam to getting a whole idea of what all those important terms are. So make sure you start preparing your terminology list. Also learn how to label relevant diagrams in each section. Okay? There's obviously resources that we've made available. Mind the Gap has got a platform for you to be able to identify those diagrams, those images that are blank images. Refer to them. Download these. You can easily annotate diagrams. By doing this, you will find that you're able to identify parts, you are able to identify the structure, and even find their location. So diagrams are crucial to life sciences. I mean, you would have spent time looking at the structure of the eye, structure of the ear. In this paper, you're guaranteed to have diagrams that you're going to have to label or that you're going to have to identify parts from. So ensure that in your learning that you've got diagrams or you've got templates of diagrams that you easily refer to. Learn structure, learn function and location. And it's important for you to be able to identify structures, Le learn their functions, and try and identify where these organs or parts 
are located. The examiner is basing his assessment strategy on the way these questions are set will be based on structure, function, location. Print out a few papers and look at the questions. And often I would encourage my learners to print out a few exams and have these exams on a file. As you look at a section of, let's say for example, meiosis, you've studied through meiosis, you've spent an hour looking at that, and then I would encourage you to open the four papers that you've printed and to look at those papers and to identify all the questions that are from meiosis. By that, you have a very focused approach to a specific topic. And so if you do that for every topic, you would have probably exposed yourself to questions from four years of exam papers. And that would be a very good review of the application of your content. Okay. It's very important to answer by writing out. So often I get learners saying, well, I've looked at an exam paper, and when you ask them, how have you responded? The examiner will test you because you've written a response. So make sure that when you sit down to write and revise, you are physically writing down an answer. And that's called muscle memory. What that means is that every time you spell out or you write out a word or you annotate a diagram, there is a recognition of that image in your brain. And that helps for you to be able to recollect that information when you're writing it in an exam again. So write, annotate, highlight. Those are crucial tips to actually preparing for just not life sciences but any exam. Okay. It's also important that you check the memo. All these exams are available, the memos are available. It's pointless looking at an exam, writing the exam down, and not reflecting on your answers. So memos are available, look at these memos. And look at where you've gone wrong. It's often you learn from your mistakes. And knowing where you've gone wrong helps you to improve and identify how you could respond to a similar question the next time you see that. This is an old and tested method, and I refer to it as the car, and this is what you drive your learning. What do I mean by that? So, when we look at content, this is the content that you need to refer to when preparing for a section. So you should know exactly what content, and that's available in, in, your, in your textbooks. It clearly describes the specific content that you need to know. So identify the content, and this would be the learning part of your content. So learn the content well. The next part to your learning process should be the application. And what do I mean by application? Application means actually taking question papers and writing down your answers. And the more you do that, and as I suggested, do that per, per section, the better your confidence in the topic becomes and you will start identifying questions that are easier for you to answer as well as topics that you struggle with. So apply that content in the content in the context of working through papers. So you want to work through exam papers and you want to identify sections now that are specific to a topic that you've been working with. Okay? The next part of your learning process should be reviewing your content. Now that you've looked at the memo and you've realized that I struggle with a genetic diagram or I cannot label the structure of the eye or the ear, you've got to go back to the drawing board and you've got to go and address that content again. So this is closing the circle in your learning. So content, application, review, and you get back to that. And if you start doing this continuously, you will see that the co your, your confidence level, your ability to be able to respond to questions on a specific topic starts to improve. So that's the crucial part of the learning process. Guys, let's look at section A and how to approach that section. That section has, remember, you've got your lower hanging fruits, which I, which I refer to as the easier questions. What you need to always remember is that you must be able to apply your knowledge in multiple choice questions. Often, these questions create options that are confusing and hence you need to be thorough about your understanding 
And by that I mean, you got to know your content well. Choose wisely. Eliminate the obvious answers that are clearly or glaringly wrong or incorrect. When in doubt, read the question again. The next part of it is knowing your biological terms. Section A often has a column A and a column B matching the terms. It might have true and false. And hence, you've got to know your terminology. And hence, having that list of vocab or terms ensures that you can access these questions easily and have maximum marks banked at the end. We've also noticed that through the years that there are terms that are often confused or easily misunderstood. In the context of an exam, when you're under stress, you often go to, uh, you're anxious and you want to go to an, an answer that you can recollect. Pause. Think about that concept before putting it down onto paper. You'll find that there are terms such as villi and chorionic villi that are easily used but often misunderstood. Concepts of pregnancy and gestation do not mean the same, but we tend to use them and often incorrectly. So it's important that we understand the differences between these terms. We often see learners confusing or using the terms alien versus alien invasive. And these are concepts that stem from your basic understanding of the content. And often when you've got a question wrong and you go back and you review that, and then you have this aha moment, aha, that's where I went wrong. And hence it's important for you to be able to differentiate your terms. Make sure that you differentiate, as I mentioned. What does differentiate mean? It's being able to find the differences between concepts. So you often have similarities in concepts, but you also have differences. So differentiating could mean what are the differences between two concepts or what are the similarities between them. And so it's a key component in understanding a question, which often we get learners giving us incorrect descriptions for the term differentiate. So examples of where this, is, where this happens is when we're looking at the nervous system and we have a question where you need to differentiate between the corpus callosum and the corpus luteum. So we know that in biology, terms are often similar but often used interchangeably. When we look at the corpus callosum, that's a part of the brain. But when we look at the corpus luteum, that's a part of the reproductive system. And hence, identify similar terms and know how different they are. The cerebrum, which is often confused with the cerebellum. Again, an important term for you to take note of. And we've seen this confusion between altricial and precocial development where learners tend to mix the descriptions between these or the characteristics of these organisms that show this behavior. Again, this comes from having a vocab list that's clear and distinct regarding exactly what these differences are. We also need to identify where learners tend to lose marks. And this often happens in question four. When we look at the essay and we find that learners tend to interpret the question incorrectly. What do I mean by that? So the examiner often sets a question that has different parts to it. And it's important that when you read a question that you highlight or underline the different components in a question. Break it up. Break it up into smaller chunks so that they're more easily identified and so that you can link concepts to different parts of the question. So, in question 4, which is the essay, you will often see that learners confuse irrelevant information with the topic. So look at the relevance of what you're doing. Okay, Link that to the specific content or topic that's mentioned in the essay question. Have a logical sequence. Put things in the correct order of explanation. Present information that's easy to follow. Remember that you are presenting information regarding a specific topic. 
Let that flow. Do not confuse yourself in, in the clutter of the topic. Create subsections in your, in your planning. Identify the key concepts, put them down, and then link together a thread that connects them and answers that question. Okay? Be comprehensive. And what do I mean by that? I mean comprehensive means in close and in totality. So try and link together all the concepts that are detailed in the question. So comprehensiveness by answering only one aspect of the essay in detail or by answering both aspects but not in sufficient detail. And we often see that learners tend to do that. So they tend to be very superficial in their explanations and do not cover the depth of the content. And that's crucial to an essay. An essay is often based on specific concepts that the examiner is going to reward you on. So if it's seven marks per concept, you're going to need seven concepts that you're going to have to add into your essay. Okay. It's also important for you to analyze the question and identify subtopics. The essay is often a, a build-up of two or three concepts that the examiner wants you to link together. And we've seen this last year when essays were on different concepts. You need to bring together those concepts into a comprehensive answer. Something to note is that the essay in Life Sciences does not require an introduction or a conclusion. It's a good practice, but often it's not in line with the, con the, the, the structure of an essay. The essay is very clear around what content needs to be discussed. So avoid wasting time on trying to write an introduction as to what your essay is going to be on and a concluding statement as to what you've just discussed. Be clinical, get straight to the concepts, explain them, and if you're running out of time, guys, you can put these down as bullet points. That will ensure that you get the marks for the concepts, but you might lose the marks for the synthesis. So it's important to write down concepts, and if you get that into a comprehensive, congruent flow, you're going to get the marks for the synthesis. How do we improve your essay writing skills? And often, the best way to do this is to look at sections and to write a short essay on this. So, how does the ear help in maintaining balance? Eight marks. If you sit down and if you write an eight mark mini essay on how the ear helps to maintain balance and equilibrium, that's one way in terms of preparing for that essay. You can do that for different topics. So, explain the negative feedback mechanism for eight marks. Identify how the eye interprets light, explain the concept of astigmatism. So these short little essay questions will help you to be able to improve the ability to synthesize a longer essay, which is made up of three or four subsections. Okay, so guys, we've spent some time looking at the structure of the essay. We're going to have a short break, and then when we get back, we're going to look at how to answer some questions. Over to you. Thank you. Guys, we are going to take a very short break, but don't forget to check us out on Facebook on Warza Matrix, as well as download the To Enable app and take that assessment so that we check it out after the show. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to enter our competition, hashtag Wozowina on our Facebook page. And remember, two matriculants get to win two gigs of data guys, so go on and enter the competition. Some exciting news now, we've got a WhatsApp voice note from our WhatsApp line from one of our learners and they've got a question for you again. So straight to you. How does oral contraception link to the menstrual cycle and what hormones are involved? Very interesting question, guys. Thanks for that. Let's look at this question. And if you read through this question, you'll find that it links to the endocrine system. It links to the reproductive system. And what underpins this is the, the concept of negative feedback. 
And I think we've got to bring those three concepts in. So it's the reproductive system, the endocrine system, and the concept of negative feedback. Let's get straight into this question. Let's try and unpack what contraceptive pills are. Let's identify the hormones and see how this contraceptive pill works effectively in prevent, preventing conception. Okay, so let's try and identify the key cons components in this question as I would in an exam. So the key components is how does the contraceptive pill link to the menstrual cycle? And also, the learner has asked us about what are the hormones that are involved in this? And so guys, if we go back into the mechanism of the contraceptive pill, let's look at what a contraceptive pill contains and then we'll try and understand how it prevents pregnancy. So, contra contraceptive pills are used to prevent pregnancy. Contra meaning against and conception refers to the process of the sperm and the egg fusing. So any mechanism that stops the process of conception is regarded as a contraceptive method and hence it's against conception. Some females use pills that contain progesterone and we'll talk about the different types of contraceptive pills. In one packet of these you will find that there are approximately 28 pills and the reason why there are 28 pills is that the approximate duration of a complete cycle in a female reproductive system is about 28 days. And in these, you'll find that there are 21 pills that contain a different concentration of progesterone according to the day, as well as we'll find there are seven that contain no progesterone. And we refer to these as your placebos. And a placebo is basically, in this case, a pill that does not contain the progesterone in it. So they are called dummy pills and they are basically taken so that we decrease the levels of progesterone in the body at that specific duration of seven days. These pills need to be taken on a daily basis and generally at a specific time that's in the day. And often it needs to be done in the correct sequence at that day or at that time of the day. What does that mean? That means that the pill should be taken every day at the same time and it should be done consistently for the duration of that period. Now, you would have seen in your lessons that a contraceptive pill contains a series of days on them and often these appear in different colors and for the benefit of today's lesson, we're going to look at what a contraceptive pill would look like or a pack of these would look like. And when we look at them, you'll find that there's an indication of the start day and that is specifically labeled according to days of the week and it will continue for 21 days until you get a period where those, pe those pills are taken which do not contain progesterone. And this, is often, this will often coincide with the day when the female is expected to, to have her period. And so... The female will start taking the pill on the day her, her, her period starts. So in the sense that menstruation starts. So that is regarded as day one. So day one would be the day when the pill is taken. And that will continue for the next 21 days. And you'll find that these pills contain different amounts of progesterone. Knowing that there is ovulation which takes place on day 14. Which would be the day when you'll find the egg being released. Now, let's look at the fluctuation of hormones in the body and the hormones involved and how the contraceptive pill prevents the process of conception. Now, this is a graph that illustrates the level of progesterone, which is measured in nanograms because they're extremely small amounts in the body, as well as the time over a 28-day cycle. It's important to note that the female reproductive system or cycle lasts for approximately 28 days and right on the middle, which is day 14, is seen as the day when ovulation takes place. And the mechanism behind a contraceptive pill is based on preventing the process of either ovulation, in this case, or the process of fusion. The contraceptive pill 
works on preventing the process of ovulation. So if I go back to the ovary, and if I were to illustrate what happens in the ovary, you will see that the hormone FSH, which is released from the pituitary gland, targets a primary follicle. That starts at day one. That follicle develops gradually under the influence of FSH to become a mature follicle having a secondary oocyte or we refer to that as an ovum. On day 14, a mature graphene follicle ruptures and releases an oocyte or an secondary oocyte. This process, as I refer to, is called ovulation. And so, the contraceptive pull, as you would see in this diagram here, refers to, and if you look at what it does, you will see that there is an increase in the level of progesterone right immediately from day one all the way till about day, uh, in this case, day 11. And we see that that increase in progesterone will continue and remain high for the duration of the next uh, 17 or 14 odd days. And this is when possible ovulation would have taken place. Now what the contraceptive pill does with progesterone is that it prevents or it reduces the effect of FSH. And hence, the process of development of a follicle does not occur, which means that at day 14, there is no ovulation taking place and hence no egg for fertilization. We also need to look at the hormones involved and let's look at this table. And it's actually a very good way to actually learn the context around how hormones are released from glands and their functions. And I think it's an excellent tool to actually put down as part of your learning tool. So we've identified that there are four hormones involved. We've got to look at how these hormones function, and that's the next part of the question. And important to this is the glands that they released from. And we know that there's a significant master gland that we've referred to in the endocrine system, which is called the pituitary gland. And I'm going to write that down here, which is the gland that releases FSH. Okay? We also know that the pituitary gland releases LH as well. Okay, let's look at the function of FSH. So FSH targets, let's identify the target of this gland. So it targets the ovaries. Okay, and its function is to stimulate the development of the follicle. So if we go back to the name of the hormone, it's called follicle stimulating hormone. So it's going to stimulate the development of a follicle, which is essentially the development of an egg. So, stimulation of an egg formation. We also know that the ovary produces estrogen, which is going to be released as a result of the follicle developing. So, we can look at estrogen being released, and the function of estrogen is to target the uterus and in the uterus it will thicken the endometrium and it results in what we call the thickening of the the vascular layer of the of the endometrium we know that the pituitary gland also releases LH and that targets the ovary and the function of LH is that it stimulates ovulation and ovulation is the release of an egg. Okay? And that happens on day 13 when LH levels peak. The other hormone, progesterone, is released from the ovary. And that is the result of the corpus luteum, which is what happens to the primary follicle as it develops. It will degenerate on day 14 to form the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will then 
continue to stimulate the ovary to produce progesterone and progesterone will maintain the thickness of the endometrium and we know that progesterone levels peak also during the first trimester of progesterone and that is because of the secretion of the corpus luteum. So it thickens the endometrium and this maintains the thickness of the endometrial layer. I'm going to go back to the graph and to very quickly illustrate to you the level of these hormones. Okay, so if we looked at FSH, which is what we, we discussed, so FSH levels tend to increase gradually up till day 14 and then we find a decrease in the FSH levels. So that's FSH. Not the best color to use in white, but I'm going to go back to looking at a hormone that is also released from the pituitary gland, which is LH. So initially when FSH levels are low, a high LH levels are low, and then you'll find that LH peaks around day 13, causing a decrease in the FSH levels. And that would be LH, and if you look at this, it's timed precisely around day 14, where this is the point in which ovulation takes place. So around day 14 we will find that there is an increase in the LH levels which is preceding ovulation and then you will find that a mature oocyte is released from the ovary around day 14. And what happens next to the graphene follicle is that it forms the corpus luteum which then continues to release or stimulate the release of progesterone. The other two hormones that we need to look at are the levels of estrogen which we see very similar to FSH levels increasing and then decreases after day 14 and that's estrogen. I know it's getting busy but these graphs are often busy because they contain lots of information and using color to annotate this does help and then finally we need to look at the levels of and I'm going to use blue for this, progesterone, which increases after ovulation and remains high for the duration of that 28 days. And that would be progesterone that we're looking at. So, very busy, but often it's important for us to realize the importance of these hormones and how they're interconnected. So guys, another feature that you need to look at is the negative feedback mechanism. And if you looked at the graph, you would have seen that at times when FSH levels have increased, the levels of estrogen also increase. But you would have noticed that when LH increases, FSH levels drop. And likewise, we see the progesterone pull, which increases from day one, having a negative feedback mechanism on FSH, thus stopping the, the production of an egg and the release of an egg. And that is essentially how the contraceptive pull establishes its function. So from my side, we've covered a bit of that question, an exciting question to look at, and a good question for you to go back and to prepare some notes on this section of the endocrine function of the contraceptive pill and how it works. Well then, that brings us to the end of the show, Matrix. Thank you so much for participating, and a big congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on the Was the Matrix Facebook page. We will be back with some more revision on your number one educational channel. And don't forget to check out our schedule on www.wasamatrix.co.za. Well then, from me, Looney, Yugen, and our sign language interpreter, Nicolene, it's a goodbye. <laughs>